Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Good day and God bless you wherever you may be on the planet right now. What a joy to meet together uh, virtually today again uh, to push, to pray until something happens. Thanks so much for tuning in again for solid meat of the Word of God and that we believe will ignite the fervent prayers of the righteous. Now make tremendous power of God available to us all to push through to the gates of the enemy in the name of Jesus. Today, in continuation of our series, we'll be looking at the subject, the prophetic implication of choice words fitly spoken. I want you to write that down. I'll be explaining it as we go further. The prophetic implication of choice words fitly spoken. Because you're going to find out when words that are not fitly spoken are uttered by anyone other than in line with the word of God, it will fall flat on the ground. For this exercise, I've selected six powerful texts of scripture. And as I read them, I implore you to please listen attentively and learn about the implications of the word you and I speak or write to people. Please turn your Bible with me to Proverbs 10, verse 19 to 21. That's the first text of Scripture. I'll give you six. This is one. It reads, and I quote, In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. But he who restrains his sleep is why. Second scripture, Proverbs 15.23. Proverbs 15.23. A man has joy by the answer of his mouth. A man has joy by the answer of his mouth. And a word spoken in due season. How good it is. A word spoken in due season. How good it is. That simply suggests to you sometimes you may need to just restrain your lips. Like David prayed, put padlock in my mouth, O Lord. And like what happened to Ezekiel, for God to lock you up until he wants you to speak. Third scripture, Proverbs 22 verse 11. Proverbs 22:11. He will lose purity of heart and has grace on his lips. The king will be his friend. Now, that does not mean the king cannot be wrong and you do not have to bring ethical correction to the king, but the king is pleased with you. He will be your friend if your words are sitting with grace. Like when Nathan confronted David with the atrocities he committed with Bathsheba. First started with a, a redo or a parable until David himself slammed the edge armor upon himself and said, that person must die. He said, you are the one, O king. And then he quickly repented and God forgave him. Proverbs 25, 11, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. I want you to imagine a king's banquet when apples are sent in, 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 in uh, silver trays or golden trays, well set, is inviting. That's what a word fitly spoken looks like. Isaiah 50, verse 4 to 5. Here is a prophet declaring what guided and motivated his prophetic utterances. He reads, and I quote, The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned. There's a tongue of those who are foolish. The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as a learned. If you don't hear as a learned, you cannot speak as a learned. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. Now Matthew 12, 33 to 37, the sixth scripture. He reads, and I quote, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, 
the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. You will know whether you are good or evil by the things that come out of your lips. And people will know also. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. You better underline that. If mankind can create uh, tape recorders that will tape what people say, how much more God of heaven. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. People of God, going by the text of scripture I just read, I'd like to impress it upon your heart that it does not matter what your status or stature in life is. I repeat, it does not matter what your status or stature in life is. It does not matter how formidable your associates and your different networks are. Neither does it matter whose counsel you seek. After all said and done, if God is not with you, the word you speak will not stand. If God is not with you, the word you speak will not stand. Isaiah chapter 8, I'll read from verse 9 to 10 to portray this point. Isaiah 8, 9 to 10. He reads and I quote, Associate yourselves, O ye people, and you shall be broken in pieces. And give here, all ye of far countries, guard yourselves, and you shall be broken in pieces. Guard yourselves, and you shall be broken in pieces. Why is he repeating this repeatedly? Because they have gathered together, the form association, they must do this, they must do that. Then he says, take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for God is with us. If God is with us, and not with you, no matter your status or your stature in life, no matter how formidable your associates or different networks are, no matter whose counsel you seek, if God is not with you, the word you speak will not stand. Therefore, brothers and sisters, the safest thing to do in this fallen world is to fear God and keep his commandments. Your associates may not agree with you. Your associates may think you have a wrong agenda, a wrong motive, but you have to obey God whenever he gives you instruction. Thus said the Lord is not something you play with. He who says, thus said the Lord, when he has not spoken, he shall be accursed. So you have to be careful to obey God, to fear him, regardless of circumstances or situation, and regardless of whose ox is God. The safest thing to do in this fallen world is to fear God and keep his commandment. Isaiah chapter 8 beginning from verse 11 to 20. For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of these people, saying, Say ye not in confederacy. Don't come into a relationship, association with them if God is not with them. Say ye not a confederacy to all of them to whom these people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts. And we're coming back again to that phrase, the Lord of hosts today. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. And he shall be for a, san he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the Lord among my disciples. And I will wait upon the Lord that hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. I hope you understand that. When there's commotion, where there's confusion, when no one knows what to do, the best thing is to bind the testimony, give it to the disciples, let them continue, and you go and wait upon the Lord who hides himself from the children of Israel. Then he declares, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me, are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. And when they say unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits, <laughs> miracles, occultists, all kinds of people consulted by political uh, 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 groups and associations, seek unto them that have some familiar spirits when they say that to you, and unto wizards that peep and that mortar. Should not a people seek unto their God? For the living to the dead, 
to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. I pray that every word we'll utter today and every day and all the days of our life will be in line with the word of God day by day in the name of Jesus. We must fear God. We must obey his commandments. We must wait upon the Lord to hear directly from God rather than taking information from either of social media or from television. Dear friends and family, if we live by the standard of fearing God and obeying his commandments, then choice, acceptable, and gracious words seasoned with salt will ceaselessly flow out of our mouths to impact positively those who hear us. I would like to repeat that. If we fear God and obey his commandments, then choice, acceptable, and gracious words seasoned with salt will ceaselessly flow out of our mouths to impact positively those who hear us. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Verse 9 to 14. Ecclesiastes 12, 9 to 14. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find acceptable words, acceptable words, like code, to, like your secret code or, or, or password to your laptop or iPad. Anybody that does not have that password cannot access what is locked inside your iPad or your computer or your phone. The preacher sought to find acceptable words, and what was written was upright, words of truth. Truth may divide, truth may hurt, but at the end of the day, truth will set free. The words of the wise are like goats, and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. And further, my son, be admonished by this, of making many books there is no end, and much study is wisdom to the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Here we go again. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. King James Version says, this is the whole duty of man, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Ephesians chapter 4, 29 to 32. <laughs> It's, it's such a, 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 a fearful thing to consider that preachers will have greater condemnation if you say one thing and mean another, or if you have wrong motives for saying the things you say, you have greater condemnation. God forbid, we must be accurate, we must be precise, we must say what we are told to say. And when it falls here and there, and people react to it different way, just calm down with humility, explain to them so that perhaps they will understand what you are saying and quickly take cover before the blows will come. Ephesians 4, 29 to 32. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. I pray that everyone online with us today in this virtual meeting, grace will be imparted to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will know how to respond to people who take you on or ask you questions. Colossians chapter 4, Colossians chapter 4, verse number 2 to 6. Continue in prayer and watching the same with thanksgiving. Without praying also for us, that God will open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I'm also in bonds that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak, walking wisdom towards them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. At this juncture, let's pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for this evening. I thank you because the entrance of your word will bring light and understanding to the simple, we trust you absolutely for clarity because clarity is power. We pray that you, can, you remove the confusion in the minds of people, clean the cobwebs in their minds, let them think straight, think right, talk right, let them see from the right perspective, let their hearts be open, and let the word do a work in us so that from that standpoint of the word, we can face the challenges in the days to come. Receive all the glory and praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. The reasons for all the admonitions 
I've read before now is that in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, words were used to create and not just to communicate. This is the problem we have. We have reduced words to mere communication. Good morning, how are you? Good evening, where are you going? Where are you coming from? It's much more than that. Words create atmosphere. When God said, let there be light, there was light. And when God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, there was a firmament in between the waters. Dear friends, this same God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness is the same God who has shone in our hearts today to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God on the face of Jesus Christ. Therefore, since we are created in the image of God and after his likeness, our words should have creative powers. And if you and I believe that, then great care needs to be taken about what atmosphere we create with our words because it is certain that everyone will eat the fruit of his leaves. It is certain. The Yoruba man says, Harsh words can lead to war, and gentle words can persuade and pacify trouble. We have to be careful how we speak so that we do not incur on or stir up unnecessary wrath and provocation. Proverbs chapter 12, 13 to 14. The wicked is ensnared by the transgression of his lips, but the righteous will come through trouble. A man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth, and the recompense of a man's hand will be rendered to him. Proverbs 12, 17 to 19. He who speaks truth declares righteousness. This is the problem I have with so many people. A dear brother of mine who is so concerned about me and does not want me to get into any political trouble or controversy, and wrote to me today, earlier on, and said, hey, leave all these things alone. Righteousness is what exalts a nation. I took his counsel and thanked him, but also said to him, righteousness by itself does not exalt a nation. It is when the righteous are in authority that the nation can begin to experience change. He will speak truth, declares righteousness, but a false witness deceit. Verse 18, there is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. The truthful leaf shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So if you're speaking death, it will come to you later or sooner. But if you are full of life and speaking life, you will partake of it. Isaiah 57, 19 to 21. Yes, thus said the Lord, I create the fruit of the leaves. Peace. Peace to him who is far off and to him who is near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and death. The moment you are speaking, something else is coming out of your mouth because they don't understand what you are saying sometimes. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. I want you to please be conscious and be careful as you receive the word today. Juxtapose it with the word of God and be sure that your heart is right to receive. It's not a stony heart. It's not the one that the seed will fall on by the wayside and the birds of the air will pluck. The deceitfulness of riches will not choke it because the word will fall into the midst of thorns. Let it be good soil that will produce 34, 60 fold, 100 fold, or 104, 60 fold, 30 fold, depending on whether you are reading from Mark or the book of Matthew. Having laid this foundation, I deem it appropriately at this juncture to shed more light on the words injected into the political atmosphere of our nation recently so that no one misconstrues our noble and patriotic intentions. I'm referring to the words, Emilio Khan, which in English means, it is my turn, that has gone viral with all its negative connotations, 
and the words, Awagangan which means it's undisputedly our turn, spoken by us to replace it is my turn. You're going to find out why we did that as we were led by God so to do. It's not that we want to be controversial or we want to be popular or we want to just show braggadocio. Not at all. A servant will rise or fall to his master. If you don't understand why this word had to be replaced, please follow me to the book of Esther to see how a new decree was issued by Esther and Mordecai to replace and invalidate the earlier decree made by Amon the Agagite. Esther chapter 3, verse 1 to 15. It's long, I will take my time to read. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Amon, the son of Amedata, the Agagite. If you are familiar with the Bible, in the chapter that just closed in chapter 2, Mordecai just exposed an attempt to kill the king to the king. Mentioned it to Esther. Esther told the king, they got hold of the two people, the eunuchs that were trying to kill the king, and they executed them. But rather than promoting Mordecai, it was Ahasuerus that was promoted by the king. He was the son of Amedata the Agagite. And he advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Amen. For so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow up in homage. This is big trouble. Mordecai was acting contrary to the command of the king. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? Uh, now it happened when they spoke to him daily, and he would not listen to them, that they told it to Amen to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For Mordecai had told them he was a Jew. When Amen saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Amen was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. He thought of a grander scale to mother all the people. But he had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Amen sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, that will be your April, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, the Caspor, that is the Lord, before Amen to determine the day and the month until he fell on the twelfth month, which is the month of Ada. Then Amen said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the prophecies of your kingdom. Their laws are different. This is the problem I have with believers. We blend with the world. We quickly acquaint the moment they speak, we are afraid. Now, we do not know how to maintain a stand, whether in public space or in private place, to raise the banner of our God and of our King. There's a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all other peoples, and they do not keep the King's laws. Therefore, it is not fitting for the King to let them remain. If it pleases the King, here is where I'm coming, let a decree be written that they be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasuries. It was ready to pay for the uh, ex extermination of the people of Mordecai. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Amen, the son of Amedata, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Amen, the money and the people are given to you to do with them as seems good to you. Then the king's cries were called on the 13th day of the first month. That's why in some of the leaves in the hotels overseas, you will not see floor 13 because they are afraid of what happened in the days of Esther. They will go from 12th floor to 14th floor. It's still the 13th floor, but they fear the, 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 13th, the, the, the number 13. Then the king's cries were called on the 13th day of the first month and a decree was written according to all that Amen commanded to the king's satraps to the governors who are over each province, to the officials of all people, to every province according to his script, and to every people in their language, in the name of King Ahasuerus, it was written and sealed with the king's signet ring. And the letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, 
little children and women in one day on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Ada, and to plunder their possessions. Verses 14 and 15. A copy of the document was to be issued as law in every province, being published for all people that they should be ready for that day. When they did all that, see what happened to the city, but see what this guy was doing with the king. The couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan, the citadel. So the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. Here is the point I'm trying to make. The moment that pronouncement came, where are the leaders, where are the prophets, where are the people who know something has been released in the atmosphere to permeate the atmosphere and to change the landscape? I mean, look on now invaded our nation, went viral, and it became something that everybody spoke about on a daily basis. If it is not canceled, it has already created an atmosphere. Esther chapter 8, it has to be changed. It has to be changed. Esther chapter 8, 1 to 8. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave Queen Esther the house of Ammon. This was after they hung him on his own gallows. The enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king for Esther had told how he was related to her. So the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Ammon. You hear more about that on Sunday. So the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Ammon, and gave it to Mordecai. The man who refused to bow to evil, to unrighteousness, to corruption. He gave it to Mordecai and Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Ammon. Now Esther spoke again to the king, fell down at his feet and implored him with tears to counteract, counteract, cancel, nullify, overrule, to counteract the evil of Ammon the Agagite and the scheme which he had devised against the Jews. And the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, If it pleases the king, and if I found favor in his sight, and the thing seems right to the king, and I'm pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to revoke. The letters devised by Amen, it has gone wild. It has been spread everywhere like hammer and fire, like what went viral. Let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Amen, the son of Amedata, the Agagite, which he wrote to annihilate the Jews who are in all the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that will come to my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, and Mordecai the Jew, Indeed, I have given Esther the house of Ammon, and they have hung him on the gallows because he tried to lay his hand on the Jews. You yourselves, this is what we are missing. If Amen had spoken a word, had written a decree, and turned it into law, and it's going everywhere. Except you issue another decree, you can't counteract that. You yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews as you please, in the king's name, and seal it with the king's signet ring, for whatever is written in the king's name and seal with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. So read the rest of the story. They had to write a new decree. You might not say, well, this is not on all four, but listen to me. The same process was followed when Adonijah exalted himself and said, I will be king. I will be king. It's now my turn. No. The same process was followed when Adonijah exalted himself and said, I will be king. But for Nathan the prophet, his verdict would have stood. As a matter of fact, People were already eating and drinking before Adonijah saying, Long live King Adonijah. Until King David invalidated and overruled Adonijah's stupid presumption. First Kings chapter 5. I beg your pardon, First Kings chapter 1. I'll read from verse 5 to 14. Then Adonijah, the son of Agit, exalted himself saying, I will be king. You don't, you don't underrate such people when they say such things. You must be strong in the spirit and bold enough to countermand that, to counteract it, and to cancel it. Or else, we are back to square one as a nation. And Adonijah, the son of Agit, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. And his father had not rebuked him at any time by saying, Why have you done so? He was also very good looking. His mother had born him after Absalom. 
Then he conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and with Ayabata, the priest, and they followed and helped Adonijah. But Zadok, the priest, Benaiah, the son of Jehuda, Nathan, the prophet, Shimei, Ray, and the mighty men who belonged to David were not with Adonijah. And Adonijah sacrificed sheep and oxen and fattened cattle by the stone of Sehilad, which is by Enrogel. He also invited all his brothers, the king's sons, and all the men of Judah, the king's servants. But he did not invite Nathan the prophet, Beniah, the mighty man, or Solomon his brother. So Nathan spoke to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Agit, has become king? Hello. You know, presumption is deadly. Every time you see presumption in the Bible, it ends with death. That's why we must not presume and we must correct people not to kill themselves before their time, not to die before their time. Have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Agit, has become king and David, our father, our Lord, does not know it? Come, please let me now give you advice that you may save your own life and the life of your son, Solomon. Go immediately to King David and say to him, did you not, my Lord, O King, swear to your maidservant, saying, Assuredly, your son Solomon shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne. Why then has Adonijah become king? The issue is Adonijah did not know what transpired between King David, Nathan, and Bathsheba. And while you are still talking there with the king, I also will come in after you and confirm your words. Verse 22 to 27. Just as she concluded, Bathsheba concluded speaking to the king, and just then while she was still talking with the king, Nathan the prophet also came in. So they told the king, saying, Here is Nathan the prophet. And when he came in before the king, he bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. And Nathan said, My lord, O king, have you said Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne? Read your Bible. It was God, that, it was, it was God who sent Nathan to David, to let him know that that child called Solomon, Jedidah, will be the next king. And he knows what God had said, God will not change. For it has gone down today, Adonijah has gone down today, and has sacrificed oxen and fattened cow and sheep in abundance, and has invited all the king's sons and the commanders of the army, and Abiathar the priest, and look, they are eating and drinking before him, and they say, long live King Adonijah. But he has not invited me, your servant, nor Zadok the priest, nor Beniah the son of Jehoiada, nor your servant Solomon. Has this thing been done by my lord the king? And you have not told your servant who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. I see the church in this array. I'm part of the church. I love God. I love the body of Christ. God forbid that I speak against the church. But guess what? We seem to be driven by deep contrary wind. We don't even know what is happening. We are either this or that. What is God saying now so that we can stand what God has said as Nathan did in this situation? Verse 1 King chapter 2. Let me go to verse 28 to 35 first of 1 King chapter 1. Then King David answered and said, Call Bathsheba to me. So she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king took an oath, come on now, and said, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life from every distress, just as I swore to you by the Lord God of Israel, he had sworn before this day. You don't know what happened in the past. You don't know why the words that have been spoken are being spoken and why we are countermand and counteracting it in the spirit. Just as I swore to you by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon, your son, shall be king after me, and he shall sit on my throne in my place. So I certainly will do this day. This day is about to manifest in Nigeria. It will be clear to all. Then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the earth and paid homage to the king and said, Let my Lord King David live forever. And king David said, Call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehuda." The remnant that refused to join Adonijah. So they came before the king. The king also said to them, Take with you the servants of your Lord and have Solomon my son ride on my own mule. He had no chariots. He had no, he had no structure. He had nothing to boast of. 
let my son ride on my own mule and take him down to Gihon. They are led Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anointing king over Israel and blow the horn and say, Long live King Solomon. Then you shall come up after him and he shall come and sit on my throne and he shall be king in my place for I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and Judah. Brothers and sisters, it was after this reversal of Adonijah's presumption that Adonijah came to his senses. Listen to him. 1 Kings 2, 13 to 15. Now Adonijah, the son of Agit, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. So she said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably. Moreover, he said, I have something to say to you. And she said, say it. Then he said, you know that the kingdom was mine. Can you imagine this, this effrontery? Can you imagine this person who, had, who thought he, was, he, he had all it takes? It was just him, 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 and him alone like the I, I, I that Satan spoke. You know that the kingdom was mine, and all Israel had set their expectations on me that I should reign. <laughs> However, the kingdom has been turned over and has become my brother's, for it was his from the Lord. Brothers and sisters, saints of God most high, no one prospers by the expectations of the people, but by the proposition of the Lord. No one prospers by the expectations of the people, but by the proposition of the Lord. I like the word proposition. It means a statement or assertion that expresses a judgment or opinion. In the name of the Lord of hosts who come into ministry, my focus is your kingdom come. Your will be done in Nigeria. May Nigeria win in 2023. And may the good Lord give us a man after his own heart who he had predetermined to be the next president of our nation in Jesus' mighty name. I hope this explanation has shed more light on this seemingly provocative issue. Now, let's go to Brad's tax before we start praying. As I said to you before, Awagagalokon is not the plural of a milokon. We are not just manufacturing words to cancel words, no. It's not a case of a macho man and many other men competing for the same space. Far from it. Neither is it about me personally, and God knows, but about the saints of the Most High God, many of us who are praying for change to take place, but due to war fatigue, are sleeping on duty. They are wine, they are wagagalokon. That clarion call is a combination of the Lord and his hosts. Hence, he is called the Lord of hosts. By definition, the hosts and the Lord of hosts represent warring angels, so that gathered in Mahanim before Jacob met Esau, his brother. Genesis 32, verses 1 and 2, we saw that yesterday. I'll repeat, read it again today. So Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's camp. And he called the name of that place Mahanim, which means double camp. Another perfect example is the encounter that Joshua had with the commander of the army of the Lord when he was by Jericho, as I also shed light on yesterday. Joshua 5, 13-15. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked. And behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? These warring angels are God's ministers who do his pleasure on earth as it is in heaven so as to ensure that God truly rules over all. You don't know they exist, they are everywhere. But if you have read the story of Jacob when he had that dream of a ladder that reaches heaven and touches the earth, angels ascending and descending, you will understand that they will go from here there to bring the plans and purposes of God upon the face of the earth. In Psalm 103, 19 to 21, Psalm 103, 19 to 21, the Lord has established his throne, where? In heaven. And his kingdom rules over all. How does he do that? Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, hidden the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, 
you ministers of ease who do his pleasure. This angel, this warning spirit, a ministering spirit. In fact, Hebrews says the mini, their ministering spirit is sent forth to minister to them that shall be heirs of salvation. Now, here is where I'm coming so that you understand our Gogon Loka has nothing to do with my person. Not at all. And God sees and he judges. Let's dig deep into scriptures and find at least six instances where the saints of God, including even backsliders who return to God, a part of the troop constituting the Lord of hosts. They are part of the troop of that Lord of hosts. Let's start with Isaiah. We read it before, we we'll read it again. Isaiah the prophet was bold to declare that he and his children, whom the Lord has given him, were for signs and wonders from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. Isaiah chapter 8, 18 to 20. Here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me. We are for signs and wonders in Israel. From where? Who has signed them? From the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. That's okay. I want us to pray at this, at, at this juncture to pray for all our sons and daughters to be for signs and wonders from the Lord of hosts even as they rise shoulder high above the perversity of their own generation. Begin to pray for your children. Lay hands on them if they are near you or stretch forth your hands in whatever direction you perceive they are, that they will be for signs and wonder from the Lord of hosts who dwell in Zion. Lord, we thank you in the name of Jesus that our daughters, our sons, will be properly brought up by their parents and they will be established in righteousness. They will be taught by the Lord and great will be their peace in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that our children will be like Samuel in the house of Eli, that they will not be subject or be victims of peer pressure. They will be well trained and polished so that they are well groomed and are grown in their youth in the mighty name of Jesus. Let me show you the difference between Samuel and the sons of Eli. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse number 11. 1 Samuel 2, 11. 1 Samuel 2, 11. Then Elkanah went to his house at Ramah, but the child ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. It was just a little child, but he was ministering to the Lord. Now verse 18. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, even as a child, wearing a learning effort. <laughs> How about the sons of Eli himself? Well, verse 22 to 26. Verse 22 to 26. Now Eli was very old, and he had everything his sons did to all Israel. And how they lay with the women who are several at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So he said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, for it is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Nevertheless, they did not hear the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. And the child Samuel grew in stature and in favor both with the Lord and men. You don't have to copy the sons of Beliah. Little children listening to me today and young people, you don't have to be victims of peer pressure, smoking aim, going to prostitution, living carelessly because your colleagues are doing it. You must be an exception to the rule and stand shoulder high above the perversity of your generation. And as you hear me today, that will be your portion in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, we have seen Isaiah saying, I am the children that the Lord God has given me. We are for signs and wonders from the Lord of hosts who dwell in Zion. Well, let's go a little beyond that. It may interest you to know that according to scriptures, the Lord of hosts who dwell in Zion also recruits many of his troops from the earth. Not just warring angels alone. He recruits many of his troops from the earth, including backsliders who return to God. And once they are recruited, God Almighty will then give them pastors after his heart to feed them with knowledge and understanding so that they can become carriers of God's presence everywhere on the earth. This is the assignment of the church at this hour to begin to identify such, to begin to train them like Mordecai did to Esther, to begin to prune 
shape them so that they can be positioned on the mountains of culture and bring desired change. These are righteousness exalts a nation. It's not just by reading scriptures and by quoting it and by praying it out. It's by deliberately raising sons and daughters of Zion who will occupy those mountains of culture and drive all the pigs there out. Psalm 87. Let's see how he recruits even those who do not qualify. Once he brings them to himself, the Bible says his foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. And we make mention of Rahab, that's Egypt there, and Babylon to those who know me. Behold, O Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia, this one was born there. If you are very tribalistic or if you are very conscious of your own tribe and that's all you do, then heaven will be so born into you because you are going to find many people from languages, nations, tongues in heaven because God is going to redeem us out of nations and tribes and culture. He will redeem us. And of Zion it will be said, this one and that one were born in her. That's where the Lord of hosts dwells. And the Most High himself shall establish her. The Lord will record when he registers the peoples, this one was born there. Both the singers and the players of instruments say, all my springs are in you. How about backsliders? Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14 to 16. Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I'm married to you. I will take you one from his city. There we go. That's how he recruits. I will take you one from his city and two from his family, and I will bring you to Zion. That's the dwelling place of the Lord of hosts. And I will give you shepherds according to my heart, will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Then it shall come to pass when you are multiplied and increase in the land in those days, when we do what we should do and position our people and raise our own Josephs, raise our own Daniels, raise our own Davids, raise our own, our own Nehemiah, then we can relax when they multiply and increase in the land in those days that they will say no more. The ark of the covenant of the Lord, it shall not come to mind. It shall, nor shall they remember it nor shall they visit it, nor shall it be made anymore. Why would they not make the ark anymore? Because those who are returning to God and who are being equipped by pastors, who are fed with knowledge and understanding, they will be carriers of the presence of God and they will carry his presence to the mountain of culture in order to disciple nations and to change society. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. I want you to sing that prayerfully with me this evening. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hand, Lord, and my faith. Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Sing it, sing it from your heart unto the Lord today. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. There was one Titus to the whole of Crete, one Moses to the whole of Egypt, one Paul to the whole of Asia. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Let me give you a third important reference here. Those who crave and yearn for good governance in our nation and in the nations of the earth should know that it's the zeal of the Lord of hosts that is a critical factor that makes that happen. You can crave for good governance all your life from morning till evening. You can do election after election. If you don't strategically position the sons of Zion, the zeal of the Lord cannot function. Good governance will elude a nation. That's why all the attributes of good governance will only manifest in our nation when the said hosts of the Lord are operating effectively on the mountain of politics or government with special emphasis on the judiciary as well as the mountains of economy and education. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 to 7. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. Watch it, it's not upon his head. He's the head of the church. The government is upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, 
prince of peace, there's a lot of hosts. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it, establish it with judgment, with justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. That's the trigger. That's a critical factor. The zeal of the Lord of hosts. There you find it, brothers and sisters. Peace is a foundation of increase. As to the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Without peace and security, no nation can attract substantial and significant foreign direct investment. It won't come. Portfolio investors will carry whatever they want to bring to your nation and fly off. In the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., peace is not the absence of tension. There's a lot of tension in our country. No, peace is not the absence of tension. It is the presence of justice. Therefore, to keep Nigeria one, justice must be done. So I want to ask you to please pray tonight for the sanitization of the judiciary in our nation. Lift up your voices and begin to pray to God that our judges must be men and women who hate bribe. Our judges must be men and women who enforce the rule of man and not uh, of law, I beg your pardon, and not the rule of man. That they will, by the interpretation of the law, begin to create a society where right is might and not might is right. Father, in the name of Jesus, give us judges, men and women who hate bribe, who hate covetousness, so that rule of law can become the foundation upon which everything is built here. Merit will displace mediocrity in the name of Jesus Christ. What is right will become what is mighty and now might replacing right in the name of Jesus. Deuteronomy chapter 1. Let's see how they did it when they came out of Egypt. This is Moses speaking to the people. Then I commanded your judges at that time saying, Hear the cases between your brethren and judge righteously between a man and his brother or the stranger who is with him. You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid in any man's presence for the judgment is God's. There are people, politicians, who pocket judges, who pay them money, who buy them. He can't continue in our nation. The case that is too hard for you, bring to me. And I we hear it. Second Chronicles 19, 4-7. Second Chronicles 19, 4-7. So Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem. And he went out again among the people from Beersheba to the mountains of Ephraim and brought them back to the Lord God of their fathers. Then he set judges in the land throughout all the fortified cities of Judah, city by city, and said to the judges, Take heed to what you are doing, for you do not judge for man but for the Lord, who is with you in the judgment. Now therefore let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take care and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord, our God, no partiality, nor taking of bribes. I want you to pray that the fear of God will permeate the heart of the Supreme Court of Nigeria in the name of Jesus, of Federal High Court, of the Court of Appeal, in the mighty name of Jesus, that our judges will fear God, they will hate covetousness, they will hate bribe, they will not take it, and they will lay it bare according to God's order and God's plan and purpose. In Jesus' name. One more scripture. Proverbs 24, 23 to 25. These things also belong to the wise. It is not good to show partiality in judgment. He who says to the wicked, you are righteous, him the people will curse. Nations will abhor him. But those who rebuke the wicked we have the light and a good blessing will come upon them. Make your choice tonight, either to be flattering the wicked people and be doing rank I did it to them, or to stand tall and stand strong and confront their evil deeds and expose it by the word of the Lord and by the unction of the Holy Spirit. Now here is a fourth point I want to make, to show that part of the host of the Lord includes sovereigns on the earth that he recruits even sovereigns on the earth to be part of his host in addition to warring angels in, as well as leaders of government. You will see that when God raised up King Cyrus in righteousness and directed his way to build the city and let go his captives, he did so as a lot of hosts. I'd like to say that again. God is interested in even recruiting 
leaders of government, leaders of businesses, leaders of nations, sovereigns. He will raise them like he did to Cyrus, who he raised in righteousness, directed his way to build his city and let go his captives. The Lord did so as the Lord of hosts. Isaiah 45, verse 1 to 8. Isaiah 45, verse 1 to 8. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I've held, to subdue nations before him and lose the armor of kings, to open before him in the double doors so that the gates will not be short. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I'll break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, will call you by your name. I'm the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I've even called you by your name. I've named you, though you have not known me. Like 250 years before he was born, the prophet Isaiah began to prophesy about King Cyrus when he comes, what he will do. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will guide you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light. I create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. Rain down you heavens from above and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open. Let them bring forth salvation. And let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. You need a Cyrus to be brought by the Lord of hosts to do these things so that righteousness can exalt the nation. And that's why you find it in verse 12 to 13. Who is doing all this? I've made the earth, he said, and created man on it. I, my hands stretch out the heavens, and all their hosts have commanded. I've raised him up in righteousness. That's the way he raised Cyrus. I've raised him up in righteousness. I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city. Let my exiles go free, not for price, nor reward, says the Lord of hosts. You can see, the Lord of hosts is the one recruiting people like Cyrus to begin to exalt, bring righteousness into a nation so that a nation can be exalted. It's not automatic. It doesn't just happen. God will have to bring the righteous upon the throne of the nation in order for righteousness to exalt it. Let us pray today that as God did for Israel through David, through Cyrus, the Lord God Almighty will give us leaders after his own heart in this nation, who will do his will. When people ask me, what do I pray for you about? I said, don't focus on me. Focus on what God wants to do. Just pray a simple prayer. Lord in Nigeria, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Let Nigeria win. Raise a man after your heart and women after your heart. Raise a couple of people, your truth, that will turn the tide of evil away from this nation and cause it turn around for the better so that there can be predictable progress in our nation in Jesus' mighty name. Well, here's a very important point. If you and I, like Cyrus, are called by the name of the Lord of hosts, he said, I've called him to myself. It's the Lord of hosts who called him. If you and I, like Cyrus, are called by the name of the Lord of hosts, one clear proof is that we must delight in the Word of God, you must spend quality time to find those words and to eat them. I'll repeat. If you and I, like Cyrus, are called by the name of the Lord of hosts, one clear proof is that we must delight in His Word, spend quality time in His Word, quality time to find the Word and to eat them. This is why our City Impact Bible Study Physical Meeting Starting afresh on the 7th of October at 6 p.m. should be considered a must for everyone listening to me tonight and everyone you can reach to say, come, let us go. We need to feed, to be strong, to be equipped, to be rightly positioned. The venue will be the multi-purpose hall of the Citadel. I look forward to seeing you there next Friday by God's grace. God bless you richly as you come along with your friends and family. Dear friends, God's word must be joy unto us and the rejoicing of our hearts, if we are called by the Lord of hosts, by the name of the Lord of hosts, just as Cyrus was called. Despite every wound, setback, pain, or indignation we may have, 
that God's word was a joy unto us and the rejoicing of our hearts. Listen to Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16 to 21. Jeremiah 15, 16 to 21. Your words were found, and I ate them. Your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. What do I do differently? I did not sit in the assembly of the mockers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone because of your hand, for you have filled me with indignation. Why is my pain perpetual? Now, that's a man who delights in the word of God, who is eating it, who is feeding on it, yet he has pain. Why is my pain perpetual? And my wound incurable, which refuses to be healed. Will you surely be to me like an unreliable stream as waters that fail? Therefore, thus says the Lord, <laughs> if you return, then I will bring you back. You shall stand before me. If you take the pressures from the vine, you shall be as my mouth. Let them return to you, but you must not return to them. And I will make you to these people a fortified bronze wall. Come on, a victorious one man army in the midst of wolves. I will make you to these people a fortified bronze wall, and they will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you to save you and deliver you, says the Lord. There you have it, people. God's inspiration must heed our spirit, man, so that the inspired word can come alive. We must have understanding to know how to operate in his word and to take the benefit and the advantage of that word. Jesus said, you do err, not understanding the scripture, not the power of God. But tonight you can pray. There's a spirit in man, Job 32, 8. There's a spirit in man. The inspiration of the Almighty gives them understanding. It is that inspiration that produces the word you are reading. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Therefore, when he opens your understanding, you will understand the scripture. Father, tonight in the name of Jesus, we receive your mighty touch upon our mind that our mind will be renewed. In the name of Jesus, the spirit of our mind will be renewed. It will be quickened so that we can take advantage of the inspired word and become inspired people Encourage us, we'll go encourage others. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Let me say this one finally. People of God, we have a great promise in the word that a lot of hosts in the day of his power will be a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people. I say that again. The Lord of hosts in the day of his power will be a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people. Consequently, we don't have to look for flattering titles so that people will think we have arrived. No, we pursue the crown of glory, diadem of beauty. It should remain our pursuit as we labor to serve the king and his kingdom on this side of eternity. Job 31, 21 to 22. No more flattering titles and stop flattering people because if you don't have anything right to say, keep quiet. Job said, if I've raised my hand against the fatherless, Job 31, 21. No, 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 no. Job, it can be that portion of scripture. Job 31, 32. It's Job 32, 21 and 22. Job 32, 21. And 22, he reads, Let me not, I pray, show partiality to anyone, nor let me flatter any man, for I do not know how to flatter, else my maker will soon take me away. Stop off flatteries. Stop it. Don't die before your time. Isaiah 28, there's a crown of glory, a diadem of beauty that God has reserved for the remnant of his people. It's given to them by the Lord of hosts. Joe, Isaiah 28, 5 to 6. In that day, the Lord of hosts will be a, for a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people. What do they do? For a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment and for strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. Brothers and sisters, I've taken a long time today to explain the meaning and the import of the Lord of hosts to you, let me now establish and give you the undisputable proof 
that the king of righteousness is the Lord of hosts and not a lone ranger. And when you hear our God, God, look on, we are talking about the Lord of hosts and his troop, not an individual. It's a body corporate. Proof number one, by divine orchestration and design, the city gates and the everlasting doors of nations do not lift up their heads to any lone ranger or lone performer or to a political stalwart. No. Instead, the city gates and the everlasting doors will lift up their heads to the Lord of hosts. That is the Lord and his hosts. The Lord of hosts. The Lord and his troop. Psalm 24, verse 7 to 10. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Listen to what the door, the doors and the, the, the gates said. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. They didn't open. Then he said again, lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. They challenged back again and said, who is this king of glory? Then he said, the Lord of hosts is the king of glory. That's the end. Shall I meditate when he announced the Lord of hosts. He was not there alone. He was not just a lone ranger. He was the Lord and his host, both warring angels and saints of God who are recruited from the earth to represent his will, his plan, his desire, his purpose in the nations of the earth. Proof number two. Consequent upon the foregoing, the king of righteousness does not reign alone. When you hear our God, God look on, he has nothing to do with a lone star trying to get position of power. No, no, no. The king of righteousness does not reign alone. He reigns in righteousness alongside with his princes who rule with him in justice. The king of righteousness reigns in righteousness alongside with his princes who rule with him in justice. Isaiah 32, verse 1 to 4. Behold, the king will reign in righteousness and princes will rule with justice. A man will be as a hiding place from the wind and a cover from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. The eyes of those who see will not be dim, the ears of those who hear will listen. Also the heart of the rash will understand knowledge and the tongue of the stammerers will be ready to speak plainly. There you have it. The king and his princes are the we that we reign and rule in Nigeria henceforth in the name of Jesus Christ. That's why you can boldly say, And if you asked what will be the end product of a rule and reign, of the reign of the righteous king and his princes, well, tell them the end product is everything that has eluded Nigeria till now. Everything. Insecurity. Famine. Banditry, everything that has plagued us will no longer be there when you have this king of righteousness and his troop and his hosts. The princes who rule in justice when they begin to be entrenched in what is happening in our nation, the change we desire will come. Isaiah 32, 16 to 20. Isaiah 32, 16 to 20. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. The work of righteousness will be peace. That's what is eluding us. The effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. My people will dwell in a peaceful arbitration, in secure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. Though hail comes down on the forest, and the city is brought low in humiliation, bless are you who sow beside all waters, who send out freely the feet of the ox, representing apostolic ministry, and a donkey representing prophetic ministry. When they come to begin to play their effective role in the church and equip the saints for their work of ministry and they begin to position them like Daniel was positioned by God, like Nehemiah was positioned to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, like Esther was placed and positioned by Mordecai, you will see change. Our Joseph will come, our David will rise in Jesus' mighty name. If you really want to rejoice in this moment, let's look at Proverbs chapter 9, 29, verse 2, and that will be our final prayer for today. Proverbs 29, 2. 
To my friends and everyone who is wondering how righteousness will exalt a nation, here is a scripture right before you. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people grow. I want you to be the judge of our situation in Nigeria today. If the righteous or the wicked are in authority, aren't you tired of groaning? Do you really want to rejoice? If you really want to rejoice, then it is time to call on God to arise and to scatter the enemies of our nation. No matter how entrenched in the polity they are, and no matter their desire to rule at all costs, no, we say no to it. Not to anyone, not to me, not to any person, but no to anyone who is not ordained by the Lord for this hour. Let his kingdom come. Let his will be done. Let the man that God has appointed be the one that will rule. Adonijah said, all Israel expected me to be king, but it has been turned to my brother because his ease from the Lord. May he, to whom God has appointed, be the one that God will thrust upon this nation alongside with princes that will do justice in the name of Jesus. This is the clearing call of Awadgongoloka. No tree can make a forest any kind. In the name of Jesus, the weed that is righteous will begin to rise to bring hope, comfort, and courage back to our land. Psalm number 7, verse 6 to 7. Psalm 7, 6 to 7. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up because of the rage of my enemies. Rise up for me to the judgment you have commanded. Verse 7. So the congregation of the people shall surround you for their sakes. Therefore, return on I. Psalm 68, 1 to 3. That will be my closing text today. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yes, let them rejoice exceedingly. If you and I are going to experience exceeding joy in this season, in our nation, in this Kairos season of grace and favor, this is the time to call upon God and say, Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let God, let God arise. And I saw Lord, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let God, let God arise. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I've given your word as you commanded me so to do. Let this word find a place in the hearts of your people. Let it produce roots downwards and fruits upwards. And let us experience a harvest of joy in this city and this nation. In the name of Jesus, let peace return. Let it be restored back to us. Let the king reign in righteousness and princes who rule with justice. The real Lord of hosts, the Lord and his hosts, take over the reins of government in our nation. For we declare that the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Dear friends, in Isaiah 32, you have it written bold, loud, and clear that the Lord God is our judge. The Lord God is our lawgiver. The Lord God is our king. He will save us. All the attributes of, of government, all the arms of government, the executive, the judiciary, the legislature, they are rooted in God. They are in God. And that same God is in you all, through you all. He wants to manifest himself. This is what we mean by our God, God, look up. May God give you hearing ears, seeing eyes, understanding heart. In the name of Jesus.